Welcome to Capitol Hill, where debate in the Parliament has concentrated on some of the bigger issues facing the government. The caucus discussed live cattle exports to Indonesia. The Parliament also debated asylum seekers and whether they should be sent to Nauru or Malaysia. And again, the carbon price was a matter up for discussion. To debate some of these issues, I've been joined by Labor MP Michael Danby and Liberal MP Kelly O'Dwyer. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Islander. First off, the Dalai Lama was in Canberra today, meeting with parliamentarians, meeting the opposition leader. Michael Danby, the Prime Minister has refused to meet him. Isn't she well within her rights to do so? Uh, well within her rights. Uh, doesn't always meet heads of state Prime Ministers, whether it's John Howard or uh, Kevin Rudd or, or uh, the, the current Prime Minister, but I would have preferred her to do it. I mean, Barack Obama has. The question uh, is, of course, you know, with all of the issues... Um, if they're not a head of state, it's not uh, it's not compulsory. But um, he was very interesting on developments within China, um, and part of the Tibetan problem sort of uh, emerges from uh, the sort of strong Chinese reactions. But you know, if you want an explanation of why a nine metre statue of Confucius that was in Tiananmen Square uh, installed by the Chinese government in January disappeared overnight three weeks ago, he's a got kind of guy you go to. But he's no longer the political leader. He's relinquished his political roles. Does that does that make his stature the importance of meeting him less? Uh, uh, I, that's Peter Hutch's point in the Sydney Morning Herald. Yes, I'm sure it's, there's some truth to that. But if you want the, his insight of a person who's been around in politics for 60 years, you, you uh, might uh, seek that insight. I, I, I would have thought that the foreign minister should have, uh, should have met him. Kelly O'Dwyer, Tony Abbott did decide to meet the Dalai Lama. Do you know why that decision was taken? Well, look, uh, Tony Abbott, a number of MPs decided to meet with the Dalai Lama. In fact, I, I pay tribute to you, Michael, in organising, along with the Friends of Tibet, the Parliamentary Friends of Tibet, a, uh, a meeting of a number of different MPs. I think almost 90 of them were there, Michael, um, who all met with the Dalai Lama. And I think, you know, Michael is clearly concerned that the Prime Minister refused to meet with Dalai Lama, somebody who's, you know, a, a spiritual leader. Um, he deserves, you know, a, a degree of respect. Uh, and clearly that was not something that the Prime Minister thought was an important component of her day today. If we could move on to the other issues which dominated the day in Parliament, Michael Caucus debated and agreed unanimously to a motion to to progress the issue, to put in place at first international uh, standards for Indonesian abattoirs. Is Caucus happy with the decision it's come to? I think it is, and I think the Caucus is uh, uh, loosening up and providing a bit of leadership uh, and, uh, you know, ministers aren't always right, don't get the perfect sort of public feeling for this, and this is why we're elected representatives. If we're not going to speak up within our own party rooms, then uh, what's the point of being uh, an MP? I think that uh, the Australian people were outraged. Uh, I know in Kelly's electorate and my electorate would be exactly the same. Those scenes on Four Corners were, you know, beyond the pale, and uh, we're not going to send any Australian beasts there until we're satisfied that... Uh, these Indonesian abattoirs meet the standards that Australians expect. Kelly, it does have an impact, though, on cattle producers in Australia. Do you think that the public concern over their treatment in Indonesia outweighs that concern for the livelihood of cattle producers? Well, well first I just want to pick up on a point that Michael made, because clearly there is a revolt in the Labor Party room at the moment, because clearly the decision that the government first made in relation to live animal exports here was one that is very different to the announcement that, that they have made today. Today it's now a blanket ban, and of course they've made that as a very knee-jerk reaction to obvious and terrible, terrible vision of awful cruelty to, to cattle that we saw on Australian TVs. Now, that concerns all of us, but we thought that the first reaction by the government, which was to, to ban cattle being taken to abattoirs, where, of course, this, this terrible cruelty was taking place, we thought that that was the right and measured response. The response, of course, now is that there is a complete ban. This is going to send a lot of cattle producers bankrupt, and it's going to not necessarily achieve the objectives, which is to ensure that we have have proper treatment of our animals overseas. It's just going to completely you, destroy industries. But do you have to be able to track the cattle to make sure they go where they're supposed to once they reach well, Indonesia? Well, well, we think there ought to be a proper audit, and that's what the government announced. We also think that there ought to be Australians on the ground in these abattoirs. Now, we think that that's the sort of thing the government should have been doing a long time ago. This is not the first time that the government has been made aware of this particular issue. In fact, they have sat on their hands for months and months and months, and they 
they have done nothing, which is why, of course, their knee-jerk reaction is even more inexplicable. Um, and it just goes to show that the government is dysfunctional right now. There is disarray in the party room. And, um, you know, leading up to almost 12 months of Julia Gillard having taken over from Kevin Rudd, they are m even more dysfunctional than, than they have ever been. She's run pretty hot there, so uh, I just have to say one thing. There's no re revolt in the party room on uh, this issue. What it is is we want uh, these abattoirs maintained to international standards. And uh, seriously, um, I don't expect uh, anyone in the Liberal Party, including the member for Higgins, to be saying that we should tolerate uh, what we saw but, in those but we don't. that uh, that kind of animal cruelty that we saw. I'm not going but to. But none of us condone that. No, well, we don't. And but we have to do something about it. It's not simply good enough to say that you know you want to, to suspend it and do nothing about it. How do we bring the industry back? We have to see that it's maintained to international standards, and that's what um, members of the uh, the caucus will be looking at to see that Australia achieves that standard before well, those, the first those exports go back. If we could move on now to a carbon price, again, much the subject of discussion in the Parliament today. Kelly, is there any concern in your party room that the Coalition will be advocating at the next election removing a pension increase, possible pension increase and a tax cut as compensation for a carbon tax? Well, well this, this supposed pension increase, this compensation that was discussed at length in question time today and has been discussed ad nauseum by the Prime Minister, hasn't actually been announced. There are no details. It doesn't exist. It's a little bit like the fictional surplus that isn't yet to eventuate. You know, we've got on, on the one hand the government raising the gross debt ceiling from $200 billion to $250 billion, while at the same time talking about a $3.5 billion surplus. It's the same thing with this supposed pension increase. But hasn't if, been but announced. If it happens, we if, don't have if... any detail around it. In fact, Julia Gillard has got a pretty poor record when it comes to pensioners. Don't forget, during the last election, we saw Julia Gillard argued against, in Cabinet, argued against a pension increase. So why pensioners would trust Julia Gillard on this issue is beyond me. Do you have any, any problems in principle with going to an election advocating a removal of a, a benefit or a tax well, cut that the we, government we has say, given, even if it's compensation we say don't, for a don't carbon impose, tax? Don't impose a carbon tax. Don't increase the cost for pensioners in the first instance. You don't need to apply, you know, supposed different methods of supposed compensation, which is all quite fictional at this point because they haven't yet been announced. You don't need to do that if you don't impose the tax and if you don't hurt families and if you don't hurt pensioners. So we say to Julie Gillard, don't hurt Australian families, don't hurt pensioners, don't increase their cost of living. It's already tough enough. And there's a simple way to do that. Don't impose a carbon tax. Michael, the, the Prime Minister released three fact sheets on areas she said to deal with uh, myths or untruths which were being put about about the carbon tax. Is the problem, though, for the government that you won't be able to start winning over public support until the fact sheet on what's actually going to happen is out? Uh, there's some truth to that. Um, but um, when we do, um, I think the Liberal Party is going to uh, be in a terrible position because then, just as you said in your question to Kelly, um, how are they going to explain um, that um, the compensation to the little people are going to be taken away from them and that uh, the Liberal Party stands on the side of the big polluters? There's a thousand uh, uh, companies that are going to be uh, affected here, not the little person in the street. But think the average Australian, those costs will be passed on. Those costs will be passed on and they'll be compensated for it. When people have the compensation in their, their hands, we have achieved two things. One, we haven't affected the ordinary person, and B, we've done something about um, the... But you uh, will affect them because the increased costs Carbon will dioxide them. pollution. You can't say that, you, you know, it's not going to affect them on the one hand, but compensation is necessary on the other. I mean, it just it's not logical. You can't actually run both arguments. When you... When people have the compensation, it makes up for the effect that there might be on the obvious price that will be caused by putting the extra tax on the big polluters. If we can go to one of the other issues, that's the question of asylum seekers. Tony Abbott and your immigration spokesperson, Kelly Scott Morrison, visited Nauru on the weekend. Tony Abbott says the detention, the, the processing centre is right to reopen, but he would have seen when he was there that some of that centre that Australia paid for is being used... Uh, partly by a school. So wouldn't there be a problem that you have to move out 
uh, some people from that centre before it could be reopened. Well, Tony Abbott said that, of course, there needs to be some additional small investment, but all of the basic infrastructure already exists in Nauru. And not only does the infrastructure exist, but we've actually done it before in Nauru, and it is the most humane way of dealing with asylum seekers offshore. And not only is it the most humane way, but it's available right now. The, uh, the Prime Minister of Nauru actually came out and said that they're ready. They're ready to have offshore processing on Nauru and they say that they're able to do it very, very quickly. Now, the Prime Minister said that the impediment to this, of course, was ratifying the UN Treaty. Now, Nauru have said that they're prepared to do that. So Although there's whole... a story saying the, the UNHCR in Canberra hasn't heard from Nauru yet, so well, how ready are they? Well, well, I mean, you, you've got to take on face value the, the comments that have been made, of course, uh, by the Prime Minister there, and he has actually come out and he has said that this is something that they are prepared to do. Now, now I, I take them on, on face value in relation to all of that, and we can only assume that that in, is, in fact, what they are going to do. But the real question remains here is, you know, the government, on the one hand, said that Nauru wasn't good enough because it wasn't humane, and now we're seeing the government have their own policy to, to ship off, you know, children, to ship off uh, asylum seekers potentially off to Malaysia in this swap deal that they've got going. They have no assurances as to how those people are going to be treated in Malaysia. We already know that, that there are, you know, there's corporal punishment there. Apparently they're going to have to wear a tag to make sure that they're not caught up in all of that. Now, I, I myself don't know how you, Michael, somebody, a man of good conscience, could, could possibly sit here and defend that. Uh, hold on a second, Kelly. You, you, you say that we can't have um, a carbon tax because there's no... Uh, evidence of, of what compensation people will get, but you say we must have a base in Nauru based on the fact that the Nauruans haven't done anything yet. So, I mean, you can't have it both ways. There's a, there's a f basic fault in your logic there. No, uh, I, I, I think, think I think is. that uh, I think that uh, uh, if uh, Nauru signs uh, the refugee convention, that puts us Australia in a different position. But that'll actually be a fact when it happens. And I think the government is trying its best, as the Fraser government did, to have a regional refugee solution to this whole problem. You cannot have people coming from uh, all over the world uh, and do nothing about them. Um, do you support Australia the Malaysian during, deal? Do you support Austra that, Austra Michael? Australia, during the, the Fraser government, had regional refugee uh, centres for the Vietnamese refugees. We all worked together, the international community, and got people back to I, various I, countries. I, I don't would, think would, caucus, would the caucus, Michael? though, like to scrutinise that Malaysian deal before, it's, before it proceeds? Um, I, I think the, the caucus will keep a very strong eye on uh, the uh, Malaysian... Uh, arrangement. I think the Minister is working very hard to see that uh, all of the arrangements are fixed and in place and I'm sure he's, he's uh, borne in mind very strongly uh, the doubts that a lot of Australians including members of Parliament have including about you. some of the uh, Malaysian uh, government's practices. I mean after all um, there were 62 members and senators who objected to the way the Malaysian government is retrying the leader of the opposition there mm -hmm. after having the Malaysian head of police admit that he beat and tortured the uh, Malaysian leader of the opposition. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on it. But I think the idea of having a regional refugee solution, bringing 4,000 refugees here and trying to stop people smuggling is a good idea. And that's where we'll have to leave it. Kelly O'Dwyer and Michael Danby, thank you very much for your thanks, time. Sandal, thanks, Michael. Thank you. And thanks for joining us today on Capitol Hill.